Hello, conflict mediators. Um, today we're going to take important time out of our semester to really uh, just take time and have a, a real good discussion and reflection on the role of ethics in conflict resolution. Obviously, um, ethics are necessary and in, important in terms of conflict management since uh, conflicts tend to involve intense emotions, um, a perception of scarce resources, a perception of interference with a person's uh, goals. So um, because of these and so many more reasons, um, there um, must be some discussion of ethics and how a person proceeds about managing conflict ethically. So um, I'm going to begin today's lecture with a couple of quotes by Jeanette Bicknell, who is the owner of a, a principal dispute resolution and consulting practice that is based in Toronto. Um, here she speaks directly about the role of ethics in conflict management. The first quote, conflict resolution is an ethical issue because how we treat one another, including how we treat one and others with whom we are in conflict, involve ethical considerations. So um, pretty straightforward. Obviously, we need to be careful and mindful about the ways we proceed to interact with people um, whom we dis with whom we dis with whom we agree, as well as those with whom we disagree. Um, another quote um, from the same article by uh, Jeanette Bickle, Bicknell. There's a saying in business that relationships are worth more than gold. I think that sums up why effective conflict resolution in a business context is both an ethical issue and a management issue. With this last quote, um, Dr. Bicknell is really speaking to the role of impact and uh, specifically the uh, bottom line kind of business impact of, of um, ethics and communication and conflict management. So that um, if we're not concerned just on a moral communication and to personal community level, then as uh, professionals, we need to think about our reputation and how the way we engage in conflict could potentially impact our business uh, profits and our bottom line. So um, when we think about conflict, um, it's important to think about guidelines because, of course, many people have different ideas and opinions about what is good or bad, um, what is right or wrong in terms of um, ethical guidelines um, for engaging in conflict resolution. So which gu guidelines should uh, determine what is right or wrong, good or bad in the field of conflict management uh, might be a question. And um, as I started kind of looking up some of the articles written about the role of ethics, um, I came across lots of comments and statements that were pretty subjective and pretty uh, and or pretty vague. So for example, um, we often hear this notion that, well, when you engage, when, a, when one engages in conflict resolution, one should be open and honest. Well, that is a value judgment that's subjective um, because another person could raise the point that conflict management should not be open and honest and that some, in some cases it's best to be discreet and reserved. So the sub subjective nature of many of the recommendations about how to behave ethically when engaging in conflict um, is quite obvious. Uh, lots of uh, subjective um, opinions there. Um, another thing I came across is that many of the statements or recommendations about how to, to engage in conflict ethically were vague. So statements such as um, 
mediation is a settlement that is seen as fair and equitable by all parties. That essentially when a settlement is seen as fair and equitable by all parties, then um, that process of engaging in conflict resolution is de deemed to be ethical. Well, the problem there is vague in that um, many people involved in a conflict just don't see eye to eye and don't see um, agree upon what is fair and or what is equitable. So, um, so how should we address ethics um, given the subjective and vague nature of any set of governing uh, rules uh, regarding conflict resolution? So, in other words, there are no laws in place uh, that have standardized what is considered ethical um, or ethical behavior when engaging in conflict resolution. Um, but thankfully, there are um, systems and processes and standards in place in the absence of laws that can kind of give us some insight into how we can behave ethically when engaging in conflict management. So um, some actual approaches to conflict management address ethics inherently. So um, although we think of mediation and conflict uh, management as something new, we know that in many traditional societies, uh, you can uh, look on YouTube and see many examples of um, African tribal councils and Native American healing circles, for example. There are many tons of examples um, from all different types of uh, cultures. And so we know that mediation has been around, so surely there are some guidelines for addressing um, ethical uh, ways of, of conducting mediation and other forms of conflict management. Um, but um, so with that said, um, some approaches inherently incorporate ethics and are very conscious of ethics in their approach. Um, in their systematic approach to handling conflict. So um, narrative mediation, which uses a storytelling approach, Native American healing circles, rights-based adjudi adjudication, uh, family group conf conferencing are examples of specific types or forms of conflict management that incorporate ethics at the core incorporate fairness and um, within the process that they lay out for engaging in conflict management. Um, so for example, with the Native American healing um, circles, elders, trusted, respected elders of the community are brought in along with the people involved in the conflict. And um, inherent in that process is a selection of people who are considered fair, who are considered uh, ethical leaders. And so inherent in that process is a system for um, being conscious of and being aware and providing a checks and balance, balance approach to ensure fairness in the process of managing a particular conflict. Um, the article that you've read that's posted on RAMCT entitled A Conflict Resolution Approach to Teaching Ethics. Um, you've read that article now, hopefully before watching the video. If you have not, you should stop watching the video and read the article first. Um, and so um, with that said, you could just pick back up at this point in the video when you're done uh, watching uh, reading the article if you have not done so already. So for those of you who have read the article, um, that article focuses on two uh, approaches that are used uh, largely in social work fields and, and psychology fields and other fields, uh, mediation fields that um, deal a lot with a lot of conflict management. And the two approaches that um, are focused on in that article are the interest-based conflict resolution approach as well as the transformative conflict resolution approach. And those are two kind of modern examples of, um, of conflict management approaches.
approaches that incorporate ethics as into uh, the process. So let's take a look at those two approaches um, in the context of the article that you've read. Okay, first the interest-based conflict resolution approach. And I'll read um, on this first slide, there's a quote actually from the article just to kind of refresh your memory and clarify what we mean by interest-based conflict resolution. Interest-based conflict resolution is designed to help people develop win-win solutions using creative and collaborative strategies to satisfy their mutual needs and interests rather than competing with one another. Okay, um, in that article on interest based uh, conflict resolution, we're introduced um, to the case study involving Charles, a social worker, Maureen, a parent, and Dottie, a child, who has been found to have been spanked. And uh, Charles, the social worker, must make a decision on um, whether or not to report Maureen uh, for child abuse. And um, in the story, the, the case study, we get to see the core strategies of the interest-based approach play out. And the core strategies of the an interest-based approach to conflict resolution include four main components. One, the people are separated from the problem. Um, so um, in this case, uh, Maureen is looked at as a person with and given the benefit of the doubt that she is thinking that what she's doing is something good and, and so she's not um, immediately just labeled an abuser and reported. Um, this is a very delicate situation because child abuse, the child safety is at hand. And, and so um, using the interest-based approach uh, definitely yields some interesting um, insights that would not come from the uh, writing up of the point of, of the report without any type of uh, conversation between the social worker, the parent, and the child. So the first component to separate people from the problem. The second component focus people on interest rather than position. Now I thought this came across very clearly in the case study. Um, it would have been quite easy for Charles, the social worker, to focus on his power, his role, his authority as a social worker to write up um, Dottie, to convince himself that he's doing the best thing in the interest of the child. It's not about his power or authority. It's more about the safety of the child. It would have been easy for him to focus on his position, his belief that spanking is wrong and that it's against the law, his knowledge that it's against the law. He could have easily focused on um, his position rather than interest. But instead, he chose to focus on his interest. The, his interest is in the safety of the child, and he made the assumption that um, he liked, he wanted to have a conversation with the parent because he assumed that she would also have a mutual interest in um, the child's safety. Likewise, it would have been very easy for Maureen, the mom, to uh, refuse to speak with Charles, to feel resentful, and to focus on her power and position she has as a parent to discipline a child in the fashion that she sees fit. So um, the second core strategy of an interest-based approach is to focus people, help the people involved in the conflict focus on interests shared interests as opposed to their individual positions and uh, points of power. The third uh, strategy is to help the people involved in the conflict to generate options for mutual gain. In other ways, how can we work this out to have a um, a win-win situation where um, both needs can be met? So in this situation where a child can learn um, what you want him or her to learn without uh, corporal punishment or any form of physical punishment that is against the law that would actually not be in the child's interest if the parent is 
going to um, be fined or imprisoned as a result of uh, breaking the law. And uh, the fourth core strategy is to help the parties involved in the conflict select solutions based on objective criteria. So we want to make sure here in this stage that all parties understand the objective criteria, in this case the rules or the laws that pertain to this in, in, enter this situation that um, all parties need to comply with. Um, so, and then from that focus uh, on their interest to come up with a collaborative and win-win uh, situation. And um, so I thought it was very interesting that this case study describes how the parties were able to actually generate ideas about alternative um, methods of disciplining the child and teaching the child respect that um, like such as teaching, t taking the child um, to spiritual or um, uh, religious um, activities and helping the child, helping teach respect in other ways that um, would not harm the child's safety or uh, harm the mother's um, freedom in this case. So again, the interest-based conflict resolution approach inherently addresses ethics um, within the process itself. The second approach to conflict resolution discussed in the article is the transformative conflict resolution, TCR, which I've uh, shortened just because that's a pretty long name. So the transformative conflict resolution approach um, is best used or maybe most desirable when conflicts seem intractable and there appears to be no common ground. Um, TCR views conflict as a crisis in interaction in which each party becomes wrapped in self-interest, fails to see the other side, and feels victimized, hurt, or disempowered. TCR does not try to change people's values or beliefs or force people to compromise. Instead, it engages people in a process that facilitates recognition and empowerment. And for that approach, the case study involving Maury, Tanya, and Phyllis um, uh, was used to exemplify the uh, components of the transformative conflict resolution approach. And of course, that case study dealt with a uh, man, Maury, who wanted to take his wife, Tanya, off of, of uh, life support. And um, but Tanya's mom, Phyllis, uh, was in disagreement. And so they used the transformative conflict um, approach to because there is no mutual interest, their goals are uh, very different. Uh, this approach was seen as more appropriate for transforming the situation to one that incorporates mutual, uh, greater mutual understanding and um, empowerment. So as you can see from the article and from those two approaches um, discussed in the article, ethics can be addressed in the particular type of process that's used to engage in conflict management. Um, Fortunately, there are also general standards or uh, professional standards that guide uh, conflict resolution as well. So although there are no laws, for example, that say mediators must do this in order to comply with ethics, there have been standards set by various uh, professional organizations that, um, in this case, for mediators that can be used for you, for me, for anyone interested in engaging, um, engaging in conflict management in an ethical manner, we can all look, take a look at these standards to give us some insights into some of the um, some of the ways we need to conduct ourselves um, when engaging in conflict um, in, in conflict resolution. So what I have here is I found these uh, the model standards of conduct for mediators. Uh, apparently, this was originally prepared in 1994 and revised in 2005. 
and um, has been signed off on by the American Arbitration Association, the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, and the Association for Conflict Resolution. So um, these standards, you can take a look at the entire PDF document um, by clicking on the link um, on the slide. And um, I have uh, copied and pasted here the preamble, which I'll read, as well as uh, kind of summarize the nine standards set forth um, by those organizations. Um, this is the preamble at the opening of uh, the document on standards of behavior, of ethical behavior for mediators. Okay, it reads, Mediation is used to resolve a broad range of conflicts within a variety of settings. These standards are designed to serve as fundamental ethical guidelines for persons mediating in all practice contexts. They serve three primary goals, to guide the conduct of mediators, to inform the mediating parties, and to promote public confidence in mediation as a process for resolving disputes. So that kind of gives us some background as to um, the purpose of, uh, as to the purpose of these standards and why they were set forth, and why it's very important for the profession um, of of mediators uh, of mediation. Okay, the preamble continues. Mediation is a process in which impartial third party. An impartial third party facilitates communication and negotiation and promotes voluntary decision making by the parties to the dispute. Mediation serves various purposes, including providing the opportunity for parties to define and clarify issues, understand different perspectives, identify interests, explore and assess possible solutions, and reach mutually satisfactory agreements when desired. Um, so what are the standards that they set forth? Here's a little um, paragraph about the standards. These standards, unless and until adopted by a court or other regulatory authority, do not have the force of law. Nonetheless, the fact that these standards have been adopted by the respective sponsoring entities should alert mediators to the fact that the standards might be viewed as establishing a standard of care for mediators. So here um, we see that um, while these standards don't have the, the standard of law, that they're highly credible based on the endorsement of uh, the organizations uh, who are leaders in the field, in the mediation field, and that they should be used as um, a state of the art or standard of care uh, for mediators. And I would dare say that uh, this can, these standards uh, should be viewed um, even for, for non-mediators as ethical, a set of ethical guidelines to help us um, understand um, how to engage ethically in conflict management. Nine specific standards are outlined in the document, uh, with standard one being self-determination, meaning that um, that people involved in any form of mediation, or in our case, conflict management in general, should participate on a voluntary basis. They should not be coerced. They should be uncoerced, and um, it should be of their own free will. They should make the decision. Um, they should act freely and, and based upon informed choices um, about the about the conflict management process and outcome. Standard two, impartial. The mediator should be um, impartial and fair to the extent possible. Um, hopefully at this point um, you have already listened to the recorded audio file that I posted to Blackboard um, from Monday's class. On Monday, of course, we had two guest speakers um, who are on that audio recording. Um, the first guest speaker, Dr. Shay Wright, uh, who is the City of Fort Collins Mediation Program Coordinator, she um, spoke about um, some of the ethical standards that um, she must, that she complies with as a professional mediator. And when discussing 
discussing impartiality, she mentioned that there's a term that um, that many mediators use, or there's a concept that's growing that is uh, states that uh, instead of being impartial, that the person should be multi-partial. The mediator should be multi-partial, meaning the notion is that it's impossible for a person to be impartial when they're hearing a live conflict between two people. It's natural to agree with one side. And so instead of trying to be totally objective, um, a new concept is to try to be partial to both in terms of understanding both and finding areas of understanding uh, to kind of balance um, and ensure that the mediator is giving a fair um, attention to both sides. So standard two, impartiality. Standard three, conflict of interest, meaning that the mediator should not have a conflict of interest. Obviously, if the mediator has a stock in a particular company, they should not mediate um, parties in, uh, representative of, uh, you know, that company. Um, standard four competence, the mediator should have knowledge and skills to, to mediate uh, based on the type of mediation it is, whether it's landlord tenant or community mediation or business uh, mediation or uh, divorce mediation. Obviously, the mediator should have um, competence in that particular type of, um, of situation. Standard five, confidentiality. The mediator should keep confidences and, um, and ensure that all proceedings are kept confidential. This is one of the um, key features of mediation is that it's a lot more private than, say, a lawsuit. And our second uh, keynote, uh, excuse me, our second guest lecturer, if you've listened to the audio recording, uh, spoke to this um, when uh, Mr. Campbell talked about, compared, reflected on his experiences of working in law um, versus working as a certified mediator. He noted that one of the main differences is that whereas law, a lawsuit is very public, he mentioned that people could come into any courtroom and watch divorce proceedings as it's a public event um, and that people can read about it later, read, you know, that a mediation is much more private and so your life is, your conflict is kept more confidential and private. Standard six, quality of the process, diligence, meaning that the mediator has a ethical professional um, duty to be diligent, to um, proceed safely and fairly, to ensure fairness and mutual respect of all parties. Uh, standard seven, advertising and solicitation, the mediator has a professional duty to um, advertise honestly and truthfully about his or her qualifications, background, experiences, um, uh, specializations, etc. Standard eight, fees and other charges. Here, um, the mediator must be upfront and open about their fear, their fees, I'm sorry, and other charges. They need to be upfront about that at the very beginning and pretty much here, um, this standard relates, uh, it speaks to the fact that it would be unethical for a mediator to hide fees or to include hidden fees or at the, you know, once they're engaged in the process, um, begin to increase their fees, etc. And standard nine, advancement of mediation as a practice should be a, um, a value for all mediators, meaning that as a mediator, every mediator is representing the field. And um, and so that they should conduct themselves in a matter that advances mediation, that makes people feel like a mediation has been helpful, fair um, to them, that makes uh, clients want to, for example, uh, recommend mediation as a 
form a third party intervention to their friends and family. So um, I would say that while these nine specific standards have been set as professional standards, ethical standards for mediators, I believe that these are the same types of uh, standards that we, even as um, non-mediators, as citizens, as family members, and as friends, should keep in mind whenever we're engaging in conflict um, as well, just uh, out of a value to proceed ethically um, with conflict management that uh, we engage in. Here we have um, some selected references if you're interested in uh, learning more um, from any of the articles. And lastly, some additional resources, um, including, again, the PDF uh, site where, link where you can uh, look at the entire document uh, relating to the model standards of conduct for mediators, um, which is the second bullet point. And the first uh, bullet point here um, is a link where you can find out more about the transformative conflict resolution framework um, and if you're interested in that. So the questions today um, that we've discussed are about the role of ethics in conflict management and frameworks that we can identify for engaging to help us ensure that, oh, excuse me, frameworks we can reflect on and, and um, think about um, that can help us ensure that we are being ethical when we engage in conflict management interpersonally, in business, family, or social settings. Hopefully this has helped you to think about the role of uh, ethics on specific standards um, that you should consider when um, engaging in conflict management. And um, again, this assignment is part of a three, uh, I guess there are three components of today's discussion of ethics and conflict resolution. The first component is for you to read the article, uh, A Conflict Resolution Approach to Teaching Ethics, which is uh, uploaded to RAMCT in the yellow folder entitled Ethics and Conflict Resolution. The second step is for you to um, watch, review the PowerPoint slides that I've just gone over here, which are also uploaded um, in that same folder on RAMCT. And the third, um, component is for you to listen to the audio recording of uh, the two guest lecturers from Monday's class. And as you listen to that audio recorded lecture, you can um, reflect on the different um, ethical issues that are brought up by both speakers. Thank you and have an ethical day of resolving and addressing and management any conflicts that you have.